We're going to be talking about mindfulness with a particular emphasis on maybe demystifying mindfulness. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, well, mindfulness is, you know, obviously a very popular term now. It's become uh, almost like a cultural meme uh, in the last five to ten years in the West. Uh, but obviously, um, it does have quite a long lineage or history. Um, so I don't know exactly where you want me to begin, but um, there is a uh, actually a New York, uh, Brooklyn-born American Theravada monk who you might be familiar with, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who mm -hmm. is a friend of mine. Um, he wrote an article probably around 2011 in a special issue of Contemporary Buddhism, I remember, and uh, he made the remark that mindfulness has become so, so vague and elastic as a term that one can read virtually anything one wants to in the, into it. And I think that's kind of, uh, it reminds me like a, a, of, a, of a Rorschach inkblot. Uh, where you can uh, in, make mindfulness into anything you want it to be um, in some ways. But uh, to be a little more serious, it's contemporary uh, sort of framing of it is that it was a clinical or is a clinical or started as a clinical uh, intervention, right? Uh, the history goes back to uh, the beginning uh, in the basement of a, a hospital clinic uh, in Massachusetts uh, uh, with John Kabat-Zinn, who um, uh, adapted uh, what essentially were insight meditation or Vipassana Buddhist meditation methods. Uh, he adapted them uh, to be palatable uh, uh, for a secular audience, namely the medical field uh, of biomedicine. Um, and he created a program that was uh, eight weeks, uh, started out calling it the Stress Reduction Clinic, and it later kind of morphed into being called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, eight, MBSR, which was an eight-week uh, program, which was offered uh, to people that were suffering from uh, uh, pain, anxiety, chronic stress, uh, and it became very popular after Bill Moyer um, had a PBS series. I think it came out in 1990, uh, and he was one of the featured uh, uh, cases. Uh, he was looking at alternative forms of healing, and um, so I think over about a 10-year period, it, it really started to gain momentum and traction because it started to catch the attention of a psychotherapist. It began to catch the attention of academic uh, people in academic medicine who started to study it. Uh, so once the scientific community uh, began to do studies, uh, random control trials, looking at the efficacy uh, of this particular method, it gained uh, a lot of legitimacy in the West because of that uh, sort of scientization. So in a way, it was medicalized, and then it was scientized. But you started out by asking me about demystifying it, but my friend Jeff Wilson, who's a religious studies scholar uh, up in Canada, he wrote a book called Mindful America, it's an amazing book, kind of chronicling the uh, the mystification of mindfulness. It's the whole chapter he calls the mystification of mindfulness, and 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 what he means by that is that there were certain sorts of uh, you should say, I guess I could say, cultural translations or rhetorical discursive strategies. Uh, to basically say that this is a completely secular method, which actually uh, is kind of the extraction or the essence of Buddhist meditation, but without the Buddhism. Mm -hmm. 
And that was kind of a, a real transformation of mindfulness because it had to be, in that sense, to be offered uh, in hospitals uh, in order to secure uh, grant funding from government. They're not going to fund anything that looks religious or has any kind of religious uh, uh, connotation to it. And especially later, uh, over a period of time, then it was started to be offered in, in public schools. So certainly uh, with the <laughs> public schools, you definitely uh, want to present it in such a way that it has no, uh, I don't want to use the word baggage because that's the word that uh, a lot of the proponents use, that mm -hmm. we have stripped mindfulness of its cultural baggage. Um, and, and that's kind of code for Buddhism. We've stripped it, yeah, and in a sense they have stripped it, and the terms and the language, uh, you know, extract, strip, it, it sounds very Western sort of colonial uh, mm -hmm. uh, connotations of uh, going in and taking what we find valuable from another culture and then repurposing it uh, within our culture. So yeah. there is this kind of critique out there uh, of uh, the colonialization of mindfulness, the colonization of mindfulness, the cultural appropriation of mindfulness. And that's all kind of a contested debate that's been going on for 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so, but there certainly were, uh, I would say, conscious and deliberate strategies that were used a lot of it's the use of language, uh, in a way, um, saying that it's a universal, uh, the term dharma means, uh, dharma in Sanskrit means a lot of things, but a lot of uh, the proponents of, of secular mindfulness will say it's the universal dharma, meaning it's the universal teaching without uh, any kind of uh, need to subscribe to any kind of religious commitment. Now. I, of course, uh, <laughs> have critiqued that whole sort of proposal. Not that I have critiqued the benefits of mindfulness-based stress reduction itself for people who have found uh, very good benefits, very you know, salutary, salutary therapeutic benefits from, from practicing. I'm not, I'm not a critic of the method. I'm more a critic of... Uh, you could say uh, the attitude or the uh, the reappropriation or recontextualization of mindfulness in other contexts that I do find problematic. I I, I, I don't I participated uh, actually in an MBSR program at the University of California San Francisco because I as I started to write about uh, as I started to write about mindfulness. Uh, I felt like I needed to go through it myself to have a first-hand experience. And uh, so uh, I did. At the and, time, were you already a Zen practitioner? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there was yeah. not to be acquainted with mindfulness in a broad sense because you were, but you wanted to be acquainted with what was marketed as mindfulness in the American secular or medical context. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to have a first-hand experience, almost like a participant observer uh, or a ethnographer of that experience to see what was being taught and how it was taught and what, how people were responding and my own sort of perception of what was going on. Um, so I'm, I'm not really a critic of the clinical application of it. I'm more of a uh, concern with how it's been recontextualized in other contexts, such as corporations in particular, because my professional background is uh, being a professor of management in a, in a business school. So I, I have a long sort of a history of uh, being familiar with what's called behavioral science techniques in the field of management and organizational studies. So that really caught my eye, uh, how corporate mindfulness programs really took off. And also in like other contexts like the US, uh, the US military, where some versions of mindfulness training has also found uh, it found its way into the military. Um, and then there's a whole contested area 
And there's other people that are out there that are doing a lot more uh, interesting work than I am in public schools. And that, that too, has become a very contentious uh, uh, place where uh, even lawsuits have been filed uh, saying that mindfulness is really a kind of a stealth form of Buddhism. Mm. Uh, and uh, so there's all kinds of uh, interesting uh, debates going on in various domains. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it brings up, um, in a way, it puts the context as something that's cultural appropriation. Um, and in a way, uh, the similarity with, say, pizza, how pizza has become American instead of Italian. Uh, <laughs> or, yeah, or, or I went to Naples. I went to Naples once and had the real, real pizza, supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that sense of, as it is, um, both dancing on having its heritage of thousands of years of practice and validation from all of these thousands of years of practice, but also trying to disengage it from its cultural implications and see if it can live without any cultural implication. There might be some kind of a sleight of hand of pretending there's no such thing as um, something can, can be independent of culture. So in That's, some way, we, we might be missing what's added um, there. There's a lot missing. Um, you know, there's a lot missing, but, you know, I, I could see the utility, uh, the pragmatic utility of this for clinical, as a clinical technique uh, that brings benefits to people. And um, that's all f well and good, but um, it's, there's, there's a lot beyond that in terms of the almost grandiosity uh, in terms of the claims that are being made about what mindfulness can do uh, for people. And, and that's where the media comes in and the, the hype starts to really kind of make all these sorts of promises of, uh, of what mindfulness will do if you practice it. And then you have big business coming in like Headspace, the meditation apps, Calm and Headspace that are incredibly uh, uh, popular. And um, um, there's sort of all sorts of issues. Like, for example, slate of hand is a really good way of, uh, I like that term. Uh, there's another sort of slate of hand that's happening with mindfulness too, and it's more political. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, a lot of my critique is looking at, mm, you could say, the hidden ideological commitments behind modern mindfulness. Uh, that one form of the slate of hand that has occurred is uh, that the rhetoric around mindfulness is that individuals, by practicing it, it's almost like a do-it-yourself DIY. Certainly with meditation apps, it's DIY. You just listen to it on your smartphone and um, is that by practicing mindfulness uh, you can then uh, adjust and adapt to any condition that you find yourself in it, it will uh, provide you this sort of the mental edge uh, so that you can get back uh, into your terrible job or your highly stressful job and cope better uh, in that environment so the slate of hand is basically individualizing it's highly individualistic in its appeal and in its kind of its marketing message. And uh, in the book I wrote, uh, Make Mindfulness, I, I kind of go into that and uh, kind of analyzing sort of the, uh, you should say, I, I should say the uh, ideological underpinnings uh, that uh, seem to be very, very uh, compatible with mindfulness and how it fits into a market-friendly uh, our, our capitalist economy and how it yeah. functions ideologically uh, as a way of uh, aiding and abetting, if you want to put it that way, um, our dominant capitalist or neoliberal sort of uh, ethos that, that kind of dominates our, our free market society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially, it's an ideology um, that, again, as reconfigured, not the 
original culture, yeah. ideology of mindfulness. But as reconfigured in society, in our society, it becomes something that fuels um, the integration of people into a neoliberal economy. Yeah, and there's uh, you know various philosophers who've who kind of looked at this, like Michel Foucault, a French philosopher. He, it function it's it, it it it's a technology of the self, as he puts it, becomes a technology of the self to to shape our subjectivity or our self so that it becomes a entrepreneur of uh, one becomes an entrepreneur of oneself. One can constantly update one's mental capital, make one you know, make oneself more competitive, more marketable. Uh, you know, there's terms like in Silicon Valley, you know, there's a lot of talk about hacking, you know, brain hacking is like a, a very popular uh, expression. We'll hack our brain by practicing mindfulness. And uh, and it's all that sort of uh, uh, rhetoric that um, turns mindfulness into into kind of like a performance enhancement technique. Right, right. So it becomes the latest iteration of self-help. And self-help itself being something about uh, you can pull yourself by your own bootstraps. And if you don't, it's your fault. But not looking into the context where people are. Um, and so uh, essentially kind of blinding people to the context. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And um yeah, the whole notion that also also there's a kind of another corollary to that is that I have to work on myself. I have to fix myself first before I could do anything in the world. Uh, that's sort of another sort of corollary to that idea of uh, that the individual is fully self-contained and autonomous, uh, kind of the atomized uh, in individual who, like you said, is fully responsible for uh, their success, uh, material, economic, and political conditions are sort of, there's a big blind spot around that, and everything is kind of, uh, all the eggs are put on the individual to uh, to basically perform and to succeed. And, you know, and then the flip side of that is there's the victim blaming. You're a failure if you don't. So, um, and uh, I don't know if you saw in the news uh well, about a month ago, maybe, uh, Amazon, uh, you, you know how stressful these warehouse workers uh, working in the warehouse, and, uh, and they've, they've been trying to unionize uh, for some time, and, and Amazon has spent millions of dollars on, on consultants to kind of uh, these anti-union campaigns. And, well, it turns out that finally mindfulness has made it into the onto the shop floor, into the sweatshop of these warehouses, and they installed a new program, the Working Well program, I think it's called, but they have these booths in the warehouse, and they look like porta-potties. Where <laughs> I know, you, you go into this booth, you know, because it's very noisy, and there's a lot going on in the warehouse, robotics, and everybody's jumping around. Um, and, and so the, you can go into this booth and then watch a, like a three-minute video uh, on how to practice mindfulness and they're called Amazon it's called Amazon it's like a kiosk um, and then you know you do your three minutes and then you you go back and yeah you know there's been a lot of news articles about uh, how a lot of these workers don't even have time to go to the bathroom <laughs> and they're they're <laughs> they're peeing in bottles and stuff because they're, they're 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 so you know they're they're it reminds me of uh, the Charlie uh, uh, Chaplin, Chaplin movie. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and so, yeah, I mean, this is where, you know, mindfulness becomes reduced to nothing but a performance enhancement, te performance enhancement technique that... I mean, I would say even more sinister than that, because if it was just a performance enhancement te technique done um, uh, in a straightforward way, uh, it would be hard enough, but this is yeah. something that in a way shifts the blame to the individual. Yeah. So, um, you know, masks the uh, problem. 
Uh, exactly. So there's a very, very profound um, dishonesty to it, or, you know, even if it's not intentional. Yeah, yeah and, and so, and, it, and again, it, that's another slate of hand because it basically takes management off the hook for any responsibility for the toxic work environment that people are in. And it places it all back onto the individual employee. Yeah. Um, and so that leaves the whole system uh, to function uh, business as usual. But in, a, dog... in, a, in a philosophical way, I think it's, uh, it's really very striking. It's the exact opposite of the Buddhist principle of the emptiness or of things being interrelated. And uh, instead of that, putting everything into that unit model of you take care of yourself and you can take care of yourself instead of looking at the larger context in which everything takes place. Yeah, that's correct. Um, uh, you know, some some people have wrote about, actually there's some studies, I'd have to go back and find them, but some people have done studies and said that actually practicing uh, contemporary forms of mindfulness can actually make you more self-centered. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't know how rigorous those studies are, but you're you're right. I mean, I mean, we're talking about two very different sorts of things. Uh, it's what happens when you decontextualize uh, a uh, a methodology uh, which was inter integrated with a complete sort of uh, very highly sophisticated path uh, based on ethical and moral principles of, of ethical and moral restraint. Uh, and then uh, another set of teachings that were focused on very deep inquiry into the nature of the self uh, uh, using uh, uh, meditation uh, and mindfulness as a vehicle uh, of stabilizing the mind so that one can then uh, uh, observed uh, sort of uh, phenomena uh, in a way that could be destabilizing to the self because uh, the insights and wisdom into the emptiness of uh, all phenomena, in other words, that nothing has any independent, inherent, uh, separate existence, uh, can be very destabilizing to someone who has not calmed the mind and, and uh, stabilized the mind. So. A lot of times, mindfulness is uh, is not really the end goal. It's not really. Uh, it's really more of a uh, uh, an aid to deeper contemplation to uh, attain uh, awakening or enlightenment within the Buddhist tradition. And so, um, most people in the West are not uh, seeking that. Most people, if you're if you're stressed out. You have chronic pain you want something like an aspirin and if you have uh, a clinical technique such as uh, contemporary uh, medical mindfulness then then people are quite happy uh, and that's fine uh, you know but I think when we conflate the two is where we run into problems uh, in a way then you know because then we're we're um, we're basically, as Westerners, saying, uh, well, well, we can declare victory as Western, Westerners and say, uh, well, we've extracted the best of Buddhism and we have it here in, in, this, in these techniques. But um, as you see, uh, the genie got out of the bottle and now we have uh, <laughs> Amazon, Amazon uh, booths and we have mindfulness in the military. Uh, and, and so... Um, there are people out there that perhaps you know are interested in, in doing something more than just stress reduction, and uh, and so I think there's a disservice in some ways, or, or maybe a disingenuousness uh, among some mindfulness uh, teachers and proponents mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. in claiming that they are teaching the Dharma, uh, when in fact what they're teaching is a technique. Uh, with limited uh, uh, potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in essence, it becomes, um, as you say, conflating and uh, turning the technique into the message, turning the means into the message, 
that the technique becomes um, some degree of control over reactivity. Um, and that in itself is turned into the ultimate message. Um, right. Yeah. And yeah, I, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to be fair, I mean, the, we are responsible for our reactions. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, when the pendulum swings so far over to the individual that it, it loses sight of uh, the environmental factors, the social factors that are also contributing to, men to a lack of mental health or to stress, um, then, then really you're becoming, in a way, um, colluding with um, maintaining the status quo, which uh, is not addressing, you could say, the uh, systemic injustices, uh, inequalities in society, uh, and you're, uh, uh, you know, maybe unwittingly becoming, you know, uh, an agent for uh, maintaining exploitative, uh, exploitative systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Including your own, uh, you know, even yeah. because in that sense, um, um, you, as you said, to put the focus on, you know, more self-centered way, you know, you, you quoted studies and you, you're not sure that they would be how accurate they might be or how deep they might be, but that general sense that uh, there's a position to say that, a certain form of practicing mindfulness in the Western world encourages a focus on the self as opposed to the self in interaction and as opposed to, in, to connection, as opposed to context, as opposed to social and economic forces. And so it's kind of blinding people to that larger context. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also sort of a focus, um, a dualism within the practice too, that's often unnoticed. Um, even if you look at the language for the instructions and how people uh, engage these instructions, uh, you, say, you say to someone, um, okay, uh, I, I am going to observe my breath. Now just in that statement itself, there's a separation already. Mm. There's the observer, the sense of, of me or I positioned somewhere, then the breath is somewhere else, and I am going to watch it, I'm going to observe it. Already there's sort of an inbuilt, inbuilt uh, form of dualism that uh, goes unquestioned. And now that, and that's not to say that it won't bring some sort of, perhaps some sort of uh, quiet quieting of the mind by by even using that sort of approach, but it, there's no real sort of questioning of the one who is meditating, who, who is meditating, you know, who, who is the one that's observing or watching. That, that right. Those questions don't go, don't really get asked mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. in these sorts of clinical methods. And, yeah. and rightly so, because people aren't prepared to ask those questions, they're not there to ask those questions usually, if they're seeking only stress relief. Um, and that's where it's very interesting because some people are maybe naturally uh, predisposed to um, go very deep in meditation. Maybe it's just uh, who knows why. And we often see cases where people, even with just a very rudimentary um, mindfulness course, not even a long retreat, uh, will have uh, experiences that they can't explain and then they, they're very disoriented. and these are known as the ad, uh, adverse effects of, of, of mindfulness meditation that a lot of uh, a lot of good research is coming out now uh, on these adverse effects that uh, happen to people and certainly they happen if you're engaged in a, a, a longer retreat but uh, so you know I think one of the problems then is that mindfulness may not be good for everybody for every every for every symptom or it may be contraindicated for some people and yeah before before going there which i'd yeah. love to go to uh, i mm -hmm. would like to come back to what you were saying you said you know the instructions of um you know observe your breath 
And as you point out, it's missing out some things, you know, who is observing. And uh, so what would be another way to approach instruction? Well, there's a problem with instructions themselves. Okay. <laughs> um, we, we, we definitely need to start somewhere. Um, but I, uh, I think, I don't even like the term instruction. I like the term maybe suggestions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think this is a problem for even very well, uh, even, even a problem for uh, many, uh, you could say, advanced meditators. Uh, you know, I think one of the issues is uh, it's almost as if we have um, uh, almost like a spy that's kind of lurking uh, in the background. Um, as much as we uh, would like to uh, enter meditation without a goal, uh, there are always these subtle sort of needs that may be quieted and lurking in the background, but they raise their ugly heads sooner or later. And, and there's, I think what I'm getting at, there are a lot of traps, uh, meditation traps, that uh, people can be uh, mm, led into these traps and deceiving themselves that they're making progress, even the notion of what is progress? Progress. Um, progress is sort of something that is very self, it's, it's kind of a concern of the self to mm -hmm. get somewhere. Uh, there's, there's kind of an yeah, assumption. An external benchmark. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the whole notion of progressing along a path, I mean, there has to be a path of some kind. But uh, uh, this is where we run into really mm, tricky conundrums and paradoxes around uh, uh Engaging in meditation, you know, what, um, you know, we obviously are starting from where we're at, uh, and we want to get somewhere else, but we do have to start from where we're at. Now, the question is, what are we trying to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're all faced with, uh, our humanity of, of of experiencing various forms of distress and suffering of one form or, or another, so we wouldn't be uh, attracted to meditation. Uh, I think uh, I think one of the issues in the West here is uh, some people are attracted to meditation to solve all their problems. They think by Engaging in meditation, it's going to take care of their relationship problems, it's going to take care of their personality issues, where they really need to engage in psychotherapy. <laughs> um, and um, so, you know, a, a friend of mine, Barry uh, Magid, I don't know if you know him, he's yeah. in New York City, he, he talks about that um, one of the problems is that people have these curative fantasies that, you know, if I do X, Y will happen. If I, you know, do this practice, then Y will happen. And they have these kind of imaginative fantasies of uh, how it's going to transform themselves. And so uh, these are all sticky issues that uh, I think that it's a whole nother book that needs to be written just on meditation traps. Mm -hmm. so, so, I probably didn't I, answer your question. Where I'm hearing you going is the idea that you have to embrace the idea that it's impossible not to have traps, that yeah. the path itself involves a recognition that you're going to time and again go into the traps. And so right. any simple instructions are going to be by definition just momentary and lead you to some traps. And then the process is about confronting the traps uh, as opposed to just having something that gives you a pre-resolved answer to everything, yeah. because the journey itself is what the goal is, that, that, that process of exploration. Yeah, I don't think enough attention is, is paid to 
in, in, in various forms of practices or meditation, schools, whatever it may be. I don't think enough attention is paid to examining in a deep way, uh, you could say, the, our ordinary mind. In other words, how it functions, how it uh, operates in such a way that it continually sort of uh, repeats many uh, patterns and habits and, uh, you know, how concepts uh, are generated, how we identify uh, with concepts, uh, you know, our whole sort of perceptual apparatus, our whole so sort of, um, the mechanism of mind itself. And uh, I, I think that until we can clearly see how we've, how we've been set up to suffer, if we don't see the setup clearly, um, then I think we're just going to kind of spin around and, and uh, play a lot of games with meditation. Yeah. So what you're talking about is that the, um, uh, the general, the concept, the operational concept is a sense of better understanding the instrument that we're using. That's the same way as a test pilot would have to learn their, you know, their jet when they test it. Um, as opposed to necessarily being so focused on the technique itself of meditation. Yeah, that's part of it. But I also think that, um, I think we all, maybe this is a different way of coming at it. And we have some sort of uh, hard to describe intuition, especially if we're really attracted to a path, some kind of spiritual path or meditation. We have some intuition that there's something beyond or something more than my ordinary experience that I can't put my finger on. There's, there's some potentiality uh, within me uh, that I don't seem to be able to tap into it or to unleash it. I, I feel like I have more creativity, more potential, uh, but I don't know what, it, what that is. And and so that brings us, you know, to to the path. That brings us to experiment towards certain teachings. So we have that uh, kind of underlying feeling. Uh, and so, in a way, that sort of whatever that sense is, it's non-conceptual. It's something that cannot fit in to our ordinary mind's way of uh, operating. Yeah, yeah. Because our ordinary mind's way of operating is what, is what producing the limitations. Mm -hmm. But we attempt to try to understand it using our ordinary mind's operations. A until we can see clearly this mechanism of mind, this regime of mind and how it functions, it'll be very difficult to separate out the regime of mind, that, that surface level of mind that we're all, you know, very familiar with, because it's not different than this, you could say, unlimited mind or unlimited capacity. They're not two separate things, mm -hmm. but it's covered over, it's obscured by the layers of our habit patterns and our sort of uh, uh, the stories that we're engaging in and who we are, who we think we are. Um, uh, the momentum of our thought processes and uh, sort of all the, the auto, automis, autom, automatic sort of patterning that kind of plays itself out over and over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to take a crack at saying it in a different way to see if sure. it's what you're saying. Uh, and yes, I'm going to refer to the practice of focusing that you've had experienced with and in focusing the sense of that felt sense so that, uh, you know, that kind of um, sense inside that can be experienced as a bodily something a little different, but you can't put quite a handle on it. And to say that our mind is normally conditioned to hanging on to certainties to knowing. And so either we don't notice it, or when we notice it, we rush to ascribe a meaning to it. And in contrast, when we stay with it, with a sense of not running into the quick 
way, the quick fix to put a meaning to it, but have the intuition that maybe there's something more there, then we're on the path. And so I'm not just talking about a given circumstance and a felt sense about something, but you were talking about spirituality as the kind of intuition that there's something more and that the possibility of kind of grasping that sense, but not being able to quite put a handle on it and being encouraged to stay in that researching mode. That's a beautiful way of, of, of reflecting back to me what, what I was trying to say. And uh, yeah, because it's really um, about nurturing uh, the questioning, the inquiry. Uh, and this is why... This is why mindfulness or meditation is useful in a sense, because if we're just caught up constantly in, in what we're doing and in, in the frenzy of our uh, uh, stream of consciousness and patterning, then we, we don't have any uh, distance. We don't have any way of stepping back and, uh, to even consider some, the, this, this non-conceptual uh, nature of mind. Yeah, yeah. So you introduce the notion of distance there. Um, that being in the middle of the experience versus having distance. And uh, so that sense of finding finding the possibility of distance while, you know, not separated. Yeah, maybe distance isn't a good word either. I, I would say uh, space, spaciousness. Mm -hmm. Having having more spaciousness uh, uh, uh in a kind of an accommodating or a quality of allowing that is not uh, hijacked or uh, entranced as easily by the narrative structures of, uh, of our identity, which is uh, almost a form of auto-hypnosis because we're telling ourselves stories constantly. We're talking to ourselves about what we're gonna do, who we are, what, what we're worried about in the future, our regrets, our memories, the, these are all sort of contents of our mind, the contents yeah, of mind. I like the phrase auto-hypnosis because what you're yeah. saying is it's not just an observation, but that's an observation that makes the path even deeper, like the reinforcement. Um, by finding similar patterns time and again, uh, we reinforce our ability to have these patterns as the template in which we put everything. Uh, and there's yeah. a self-reinforcing quality to it. Well, this brings up a really important point, is when you first asked me the question about instructions, and that's why I think there is no one technique or one method. Um, uh, our minds are so tricky uh, and so uh, well-established in terms of... Um, uh, operating almost, you know, quite efficiently and effectively, because I think our ev evolutionary, our evolutionary sort of uh, path is that if if they didn't, we wouldn't be surviving as a biological species. So our minds are set up to protect us, so that we can survive. And uh, the problem is, is that they may have. We, I think we've got our survival pretty well under control, uh, most people. Uh, and, and so it's almost like if we think of the term homo sapien, right? We've got the, the, we've got the biological part down pretty well. And that's the part that is constantly uh, reproducing itself, not just uh, biologically, but mentally. It's kind of like churning out the patterns over and over and over again. Um, you know, we like what we know, and uh, we don't like the unknown. So we want to make the unknown known. Uh, but once it becomes known, it just becomes part of the apparatus again. And so uh, I think what I'm getting at is that um, there's, there's sort of this weird bias that, what's your practice? And I get that question, what's your practice? I'm like, well, I don't have any one practice. I have many, 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 many types of practices, and I, I don't see practice as some sort of isolated, formalized, uh, uh, offline thing that I have to do. I mean, I see value in that. I see value in certain forms of sitting practice. But 
just sitting quietly is not going to cut it. I mean, because the mind is so tricky. It's it's uh, it requires um, almost uh, you know using all the juices of our creative intelligence and bringing them the bear uh, to aid our ability to uh, understand in a deep way uh, who we are, uh, the sapient part, the, the knowingness, the knowing part of Homo sapien. There's a, there's a kind of a capacity of knowing which may not be limited in space and time in terms of its capacity of that there's only a imagined self who has the ability to know the self is a particular kind of uh image that has told itself through culture and through our upbringing through our uh lineage of of history that uh that knowledge is the property of a self and knowledge can't operate without a self. And so uh, we have to bring to bear our critical intelligence and not just resort to quietism. So a lot of meditation becomes kind of a passive form of quietism. Calm, we be calm and peaceful. But that only lasts for so long. Mm -hmm. Only when you're doing a particular calming practice. And, and so there's this dichotomy or this sort of split between what's called formal practice and regular life. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because um, the, it's easy to caricature this into practice as being artificially calm and artificially sedate and artificially accepting. Um, but the other approach you suggest is really that there is a very um very powerful stream of inquiry that is about going at uh, you know essentially potentially destroying the roots of everything that's established um of uh, questioning everything not, yeah. not in a nihilistic way, but in no, the not sense a nihilistic of, way, right? Yeah, no, but in the yeah. sense of saying any any explanation I can find is probably limited in nature and sheds some light, but is not the be all and end all. And so there is kind of a curiosity about seeing, you know, what there might be beyond that. Yeah, I, you know, in a way. We have to use words, and words are always yeah. problematic. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but um, if we thought of consciousness as another word, or no knowingness, if, I don't like the word knowledge; it sounds static. But knowingness, what if you know? What if it's, it is an organic property of the universe, which um, grows? It can grow, so that any any limit any kind of conclusion that one comes to is uh, arbitrary. Uh, it's, uh, it may be useful for certain purposes, uh, but that puts another limit uh, on yeah, knowledge. So it's, it's interesting, yeah. just even in your choice of um, using the word knowingness as opposed to knowledge, because knowledge is a noun, it's an end in itself, there's an object, and so the object is a something that is known. But you're shifting the focus to saying life, uh, intelligent life, is the process, the ongoing process of being in a knowing process or of a, right. an activity, um, very different from any object that comes along the way. Yeah, I mean, our image of ourselves is one of being separate uh, and independent from what we know, a subject-object duality. But there's another image that can be contemplated as the undivided universe. An undivided universe, which is knowingness, is knowing itself. Mm -hmm. And we are a, a wave, one wave or particle uh, in that sort of soup. <laughs> right, right. So, so then, uh, in essence, that um, if we're seeking 
knowledge as you know enlightenment something definite and so on we're in the illusion of something that that object but when we are in the process of knowing or seeking knowledge in that ongoing thing we're participating in essentially the functioning of the universe as something that's a knowing process that is engaged in that process and so it's not about so much having it as being part of it Right, and it's not something that one can possess, possess, possess like an like a possession, like right. a trophy, uh, or make a claim. Uh, it's participating a, in. Right. Uh, yeah. So that's a whole sort of different vision of reality, which mm -hmm. um, really departs from our scientific materialist view, and um, uh, you know, calls into question. Um, very fundamental facets of uh, of our human uh, human being, uh, being human. Um, in a way, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I I don't know how deep you want to go here, but in a way, you could say that um, we're participating. Uh, uh, you could say that it's almost like a dance that uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're dancing with reality, uh, and it's because it's in continuous mm -hmm. flux, and it, it changes. It has uh, colors, there's shapes, there's forms, and there it's almost like a uh, a, a symphony of uh, of phenomena that's occurring constantly. Uh, and uh, the question is, can we? dance rather than take a position and then try to attain some sort of uh, illusionary perm sense of, of separateness and permanence because that's what we try to do we try to nail down reality conceptually we try to know things and protect ourselves we create fortresses uh, uh, to give us this kind of uh, delusionary sense of uh, uh, permanence uh, within something that is constantly changing and in flux so the images that come to mind, I'm not sure whether they capture what you're uh -huh. saying, but uh, is sometimes you see a dance performance in the sense of ballet or modern dance where you see a dancer leaping and you have the yeah. picture that's been taken through a very special camera and you yeah. just see the person flying open in the moment. Um, and it captures something that is, in a way, it exists because it happened, but it doesn't exist because that static position is absolutely impossible to maintain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the uh, other image that comes is if you want to understand dance, you see people dancing, you have to go into the dance itself and to understand it from inside out while participating in the dance. Yeah, that's a really good way of thinking about it because in a, t in a way, our... Our usual cognitive apparatus, our usual ordinary mind, is trying to always freeze frame reality. Mm -hmm. It's trying to reify things uh, to give us a sense of control. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a, in a way, it kind of backfires on us because time is something which um, often feels like a hostile alien force bearing down on us because we're not participating in time. We're trying right. to stand back from it. Right, right. We're trying to say, oh, no, no, I'm a bystander. I'm an isolated observer here. And I'm going to do everything in my power to try to avoid uncertainty and death and and all these things that I don't know about. I'm going to try to make them things certain. And then I know who I am and I know who those people are and what my assets are, um, my retirement fund, whatever it may be. <laughs> and... Uh, and that sense of security is is on shaky foundations. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's really a, a way to bypass the reality of uh, uncertainty. Yeah, I mean, this is why you use dance, and I have a lot of friends who are jazz musicians, and they love uncertainty to some degree. Not all the time, but they have to be open to the unknown and and um, kind of lean into that that risk uh, of of seeing what what will emerge as they engage in their solos because sure they have the skills and they've practiced and they have their routines and the drills and the scales and all the repertoire and transcribing 
John mm-hmm. Coltrane. They they got that. But when when push comes to shove and they're playing live, they'll draw on that. But to really be a great jazz musician, you have to let that go and, and be open to the unknown and, and let time conduct you. You become it comes th- it's it's coming through you. You're not separate. You're you're a, you're like a live wire, and you let that wire vibrate however it vibrates. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. There's, a, there's so, a trust. There's a trust factor. Uh, yeah. So what I'm what I'm hearing is that the analogy would be that you somebody who would imagine playing jazz by having notes being transcribed of a great jazz musician and playing them by rote um, as opposed to improvising and would be missing out what jazz is all about. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Some of the meditation forms are a little bit like this in the sense of negating that aspect of dealing with the uncertainty of life and finding a refuge in something in an activity called meditation that Uh gives you an oasis of stability. Oh, that's that's great because... You know, one of the aspects of uh, the, the equation here is action. Right. Uh, and the action side is often referred to as compassion, which I think that's also a word that's um, misunderstood. Uh, but compassion is not some sentimental, sloppy sympathy that one conjures up. No, it's spontaneous action that's right for the moment, for the right place, at the right time in the right circumstance and it's it's not something that a self in enacts it's something that comes through you could say the appearance of a body and mind that is dancing that is playing jazz it's it's some sort of spontaneous action that uh has beneficial effects usually right right so So it's not going to happen without interaction yeah, yeah. If what um, you're trying to do I, I think a, yourself from interaction, then you are in a perfect recipe for not having it. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of the social, um, yeah, it's sort of a social improvisation. You know, it is, it's interactive improvisation. It's improvisational mm-hmm. uh, with uh, all, the whole field. It's like a field. It's like an all-embracing field of phenomena. Um, which uh, it's not taking refuge in a cave. It's not taking refuge into one's a safe little practice, you know. Uh, you know, I think that's where we have a lot of uh, misunderstanding too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an embracing of interaction, an embracing of interaction as opposed to hiding. Hiding, taking a time out, um, yeah, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, I didn't. I didn't expect that our conversation would uh, move <laughs> in this direction. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the improvisation part. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a lot more fun talking about this than it is, to be honest with you, than talking about. Uh, Mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm.